Hello and welcome to topic five, lecture two. And in this uh, lecture, we're gonna be learning about the elements of the crime. So what are you gonna be learning about in this lecture? So this week we are reading the first half of chapter four, okay? And next week we, we are gonna be reading the second half, okay? So this week we're gonna be we're acting like we're prosecutors, okay? Um, I mean, we, we learned about the difference between criminal and civil law, but now we're going to focus on sort of the way that the prosecutors approach criminal law, okay? And so that's why this um, lecture is dedicated to the elements of the crime, because prosecutors, their job is to convict somebody of a crime after they charge them. And so for a prosecutor, prosecutor to convict someone of a crime, they must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the elements of the crime. Now, next week, you're going to put your defense attorney's hat on. And rather than trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody is, in fact, guilty, you are going to be raising doubt about the elements of the crime. And so next week, we're going to be learning about criminal defenses, excuse and justification defenses. OK, so this week, prosecutor, next week, defense attorney. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's go ahead and list the elements of the crime, and then we're gonna go through each of them in the following slides. So the elements of the crime are that a prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused engaged in a criminal act, actus reus, the guilty act. Then the prosecutor, or not then, but the prosecutor also has to demonstrate that the accused had the intent to commit the crime, mens rea, the guilty mind. In other words, that they knowingly and intentionally committed the crime. They knew what they were doing. Um, that both actus reus and mens rea had to be concurrently present at the time of the crime commission. That the defendant's actions were the proximate cause of the resulting injuries, okay? And so that the actus reus was what caused um, the harm to the, the victim, um, that the action is the immediate or in close relationship with the injury, and that actual harm was caused, okay? Um, and so these are the elements of the crime that the prosecutor needs to deal with. We're going to deal with the four of these, okay? The actus reus, mens rea, the proximate cause, and then the actual harm. Um, the, both the actus reus and the mens rea being concurrently present, um, you know, that just basically means that the act and the intent need to be present at the time of the crime, okay? So, I mean, it, you know, it just we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about that, but you can read more about it in your textbook. So let's go ahead and get started and dig into the other four elements of the crime. So let's start with actus reus, the guilty act. All right, so you cannot charge people for criminal thoughts. You can only charge people with criminal acts, okay? I mean, for gosh sakes, this isn't Orwell's 1984. Hopefully you've read that novel. It's a great book. Um, and in that, they, they actually had the thought police. I mean, that they were trying to figure out what people were thinking. Were they thinking about crimes? Kids would listen to what their parents were saying as they dreamed at night, and then they would contact the thought police, right? Uh, we don't live in that world yet, right? And so, um, you know, you can think as much as you want about killing your neighbors, your husband, whatever, right? Um, but that's not actus reus, right? That's the guilty thought, not the guilty act. Now, keep in mind that you can think about engaging in crimes. However, if you talk about engaging those crimes, then it's no longer a thought, okay? Um, words are acts, okay? So if you threaten somebody with bodily harm, that's an actus reus. Um, if you lie on the stand, that's actus reus, okay? Because you, words are acts. If you conspire to commit a crime, even if you don't end up committing the crime, but you are conspiring, you are planning and talking to others, that is a guilty act, okay? So thoughts, not acts, words, acts. Now, the acts must, the act uh, must actually be a crime, okay? Um, substantive criminal law, okay? And there are a lot, <laughs> as it says there, um, there are a lot of activities that people engage in that are harmful. We talked about that earlier in the semester. 
But just because uh, an act is harmful does not necessarily mean that it's a crime. Uh, so for an example, I mean that you could fake an illness, okay? Uh, that you could um, pretend like you have some horrible illness. Uh, you could, you know, uh, tell all your friends about it. They bring you over casseroles. You know, you tell your boss, get off work or whatever, right? I mean, you can fake an illness, but you know, faking an illness isn't a crime. Now, if you fake an illness and then go in and try to get health insurance or have some sort of like benefit from being sick, now that is a crime because that's fraud. Um, but hey, faking an illness, at least as, as far as I know, is not an actually like defined crime, at least not in the state of Wisconsin, although I guess I could be wrong. So the act itself must really be a crime. It doesn't necessarily just need to be harmful or not harmful. It just needs to be spelled out in state statute or federal code. And the act must be voluntary, okay? If you, you could engage in a guilty act, right? Um, but if you didn't like have any control of your actions, then it's not, it does not satisfy that, that element of the crime. So for example, you know, if, um, you know, I'm sitting in a classroom and I have a seizure, right? And my body and arms flail around so much that I actually end up like punching the person next to me with my seizing arms. Um, then I, I mean, I couldn't be uh, charged with battery, right? Because I didn't have any control over those actions. Now, look, if I know I have seizures and I get in a car and I have a seizure and I kill somebody, that's different, right? Because you, you, you know, would be negligence in terms of your action. Um, but the act must be voluntary. And, you know, th this fits in great with the, the article we just read, Kenneth Park, right? Kenneth P Park got in, was sleepwalking, got in his car, went and killed his in-laws, right? Um, but it was not a voluntary act. He had no control over the sleepwalking. Therefore, no actus reus. Now, keep in mind that actus reus um, includes failure to act because failing to act is actually an action. So, for example, I'm married to Big Beard, Beard Mike who you met last week. And, um, you know, uh, I have a, a legal obligation to um, get him help if he needs help when if he's in a medical crisis. So let's say, you know, we're sitting around the house and then you know, we're watching the Brewers and the Brewers lose and two games in the, you know, the, 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 the first round of the playoffs. And then my husband goes into cardiac arrest, right? And I'm like, nah, screw it. I'm not going to call 911, right? He's better off dead with the way the Brewers lost. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that, uh, that would be a failure to act. And that's a guilty act. I have a legal obligation to call 911 and get help for my husband. And of course I would. Um, but keep in mind, um, failing to act is in fact an action. Okay. So we know that uh, there was a guilty act. We know somebody was murdered or we know that, you know, a car was st stolen, right? Um, so we know that there was a guilty act. But the prosecutor actually has to prove that actus reus. They have to prove that the person that was charged with the crime actually engaged in that criminal act. Because if you don't prove that, you could say, yeah, a crime took place, but the person you charged was not the one who, who engaged in that guilty act. And so how does a prosecutor go about proving actus reus? Um, well, for one, they look at the criminal statute and the criminal statute will um will outline uh what uh constitutes a crime okay and so it will um you know actually spell out in detail uh, what an individual needs to do to engage in a crime and you can take a look at course commentary where i spell it out in more detail so you look at the criminal statute and then they said okay did this individual engage in these these actions as defined by this uh uh statute uh, but then you actually have to prove that that person engaged in that act. And the way you might go about doing that is through forensics, um, you know, video surveillance, uh, eyewitness. You could get yourself a confession. That's super fantastic, usually, unless you coerce it out of them. Um, but right, you could sort of say, okay, this is the crime through the criminal statute. And this is the person who did the crime, the guilty act. Let me show you why. Well, it, this person's fingerprints were ev everywhere. We've got video surveillance of this person going into this domicile and then leaving with a television set, right? Um, that there were eyewitnesses that saw them. Um, this person made a confession, okay? So all of those, it's not an exhaustive list, but all of those are ways that, that, that the prosecutor could prove that the person actually engaged in actus reus.
All right, now let's turn our sights to mens rea, the guilty mind. All right, so the first element is actus reus, but you also have to prove mens rea. And so for an act to be criminal, for, for there to be actus reus, the person must have intended to commit the crime, okay? So you can have actus reus, but for the act to actually be criminal, um, the person must have intended to commit the crime. In other words, they must have acted in it knowingly, willingly, recklessly, with forethought. In other words, they, they sort of knew the consequences of their action. They acted in a way that had some willingness behind it, that you thought about it in advance, um, or that you were reckless in your behavior. And so um, that's what actus reus is, right? Um, that, that the person has intended to commit the crime and how we know whether they intended it or not was to show evidence that they knowingly committed this act, that they did it, did it willingly, they did it with forethought, or they did it recklessly. Now, keep in mind that mens rea is legally present even in reckless and negligent behavior. You know, you might say, hey, I didn't intend to hurt somebody, um, you know, uh, but you may not have intended to hurt somebody, but you engaged in actions, reckless actions that you should have known might have resulted in um, in some sort of harm to that person, okay? And so while it might not be directly intentional, it, it, it is in a way intentional because you should have known better. Um, now, reckless is more serious because it gambles with the safety of others. It's like you're taking risks knowing that um, something bad could happen, but hoping, it, hoping that it doesn't happen. Um, and negligent is, is, is less um, is less serious. <clears throat> the example that I usually use to di uh, di distinguish between reckless and negligent has to do with the baby example. And so um, imagine that there's a, an infant, like six months old or something like that. <clears throat> and there's a person who takes the baby and then they're throwing the baby up in the air, right? And, and they're in a house, right? With pretty low ceilings. And they're going, woo, 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 throwing the baby up, right? Um, and everybody's like, cut it out, stop. They're like, oh, nothing's going to happen. And then, um, you know, they throw it up, the baby up into the air, and then the baby hits its head on the ceiling, conks out, they got to take it to the emergency room, right? That's clearly reckless behavior, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if you're throwing a baby up into the air and the ceiling is definitely within reach, that something harm harmful is going to happen. And that's going to be more serious. Now, negligent would be an example, like let's say that... Um, you have a parent who's coming home from a really long day at work. They pick up their kid from daycare. Um, you know, they had gone grocery shopping before they picked up the kid. Uh, so they had groceries. They have the baby in the in the in the car seat you know, carrier thing, and then you know they come into the into the into the house, and um, you know the mom has the baby or the the person has the baby in one hand and the groceries in the other hand. Um, and then they um, put the groceries on the floor, but they put the baby up on the counter, okay? And then the, the person turns around to put the groceries in the refrigerator, okay? And then their golden retriever dog jumps up, and knocks the baby off of the counter, okay? And then the baby gets hurt and has to be taken to the ER. Um, you know, that is negligent behavior. It's sort of like, it's like you engaged in, you know, behavior um, that, you know, you weren't really thinking, you were sort of checked out a little bit. Um, it, it's much harder to, you know, prosecute somebody for negligence, but, but it is possible. Okay. Now for some crimes, strict liability crimes, you don't need to prove mens rea. Okay. Usually you have to prove actus reus and mens rea, but in some cases you do not need to prove that the person intended to commit a crime. And, um, and, uh, you only need to prove that the person engaged in the act. Okay. Um, and why is that? Well, a really good example of this is um, statutory rape. Statutory rape is when an adult has sex with an underage person, somebody under the age of 18, although I guess it depends on what state you live in, okay? Um, well, um, you could prove the act, but nobody's going to admit that they intended to have um, sex with somebody underage. They would have said, oh my God, this person looked much older. I thought they were, you know, 25, right? Um, well, because uh, as a deterrent saying, hey, you could say you didn't intend to have sex with 
somebody was under, underage, but you did anyways, and that's what you get prosecuted for. You don't have to pro prove mens rea. Same with like selling cigarettes or alcohol to a minor, right? The fact that you did it, that is an, that in and of itself is, is enough. So how does a prosecutor prove mens rea? How do they prove intent? Well, um, there's several ways that they could do it. And this, again, is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Um, they can show that the accused talked to others about engaging in the act, right? You know, I'm thinking about committing this crime. I'm thinking about doing that. Um, that means that, you know, they, they had forethought um, that they kind of knew they were in, maybe intending, sharing it. That would be enough to prove mens rea. Um, if you could show that the individual um, took actions to prevent being caught, um, you know, let's say that you went in to commit a crime like a school shooting, heaven forbid, and before you entered into the building or right after you enter into the building, uh, you uh, lock the doors, right? And then you go on your on your killing spree. Well, that's definitely a good example of that. You, you know what you're doing. You possess the guilty mind because you understood the consequences of your actions and you really didn't want to get caught for that. And then also, you know, you could say that they had a motive to do it. Um, and so there was some intentionality because they would get some gain from it. Um, and for recklessness, you could say, hey, they've engaged in this behavior before, right? Um, and maybe nothing bad happened before, but they kind of already knew the dangers associated with it, okay? Again, it's not an exhaustive list, but those are some of the things that a prosecutor would look towards to prove mens rea. So let's move on to causation. So causation is about whether or not the person that's charged with the crime is actually the cause of the harm that, you know, is the result of the criminal act, right? Criminal acts often, if not always, result in some sort of harm. And so the prosecutor needs to prove that the person charged with the crime, that they are the cause of that harm, okay? And so um, when you say that the conduct, uh, that the accused conduct, the actus reus, is the proximate cause of the harm, it, it's basically saying that it's in close relationship to, that's what proximate means. Now there are different categories or like levels of proving causation. The easiest for the prosecutor is what would be absolute causation, okay? where there's really no doubt at all that the actions of the criminally accused are the cause of the harm. So for example, Chris takes out a gun, he shoots Sandy in the chest, Sandy dies. There's really no doubt that the shooting of the gun into Sandy's chest caused Sandy to die. Another absolute cause is Chris robs Sandy. Sandy runs into the street to escape, gets hit by a car, dies. Chris is responsible for that death, that harm because Sandy would not have run into that street had Chris not tried to rob him. Um, in the middle, sort of maybe more difficult to prove would be um, a possible cause. Uh, so for example, Chris robs Sandy. Sandy is extraordinarily frightened. Um, they do get, you know, they're robbed, but they're able to, you know, go home after talking to the cops. And then later in the day, Sandy dies of a heart attack. Um, you know, was the accused conduct the, the cause of that harm? Uh, you could say that it was, right? I mean, because Sandy was, in, there was no other reason Sandy would have been so frightened, um, so anxious that it aggravated his heart, right? Um, and so it's not as strong as absolute, but I think it could still make a pretty strong case if you were a good prosecutor. Not likely cause is that Chris robbed Sandy. Later in the day, Sandy is electrocuted by a toaster. You might be like, well, I don't even see the relationship between the action of robbing and being electrocuted by a toaster. Well, I guess you could say that Sandy was really like upset by being uh, robbed, uh, really shaky. They come home after talking to the cops and uh, you know they get some water and they're gonna make uh, some toast to calm down. And then they drink water and you know, they've got the toast in the toaster and drink water and they're so nervous that they drop the water and zzz, you know, uh, Sandy gets electrocuted. A little bit harder to prove that, okay? Um, there's an actual really famous case um, uh, that sort of deals with this. Uh, it was the case, um, it was from many years ago. I don't know actually how famous it is, but um, it was a case of a, a, an au pair, a nanny, who um, <clears throat> was found uh, guilty of um, uh, shaking a baby to death, the, the baby that was in her care. 
And so, um, you know, there's the shaken baby syndrome that if you shake a baby too hard, it can cause um, uh, uh, a cerebral hemorrhage and the baby can die. And um, that's what happened to the baby. Um, I guess, the, you know, the, the au pair was um, watching the baby and then the baby, you know, basically passed out, called 911. Uh, and then they took the baby to the hospital and then they said, well, this baby's had a cerebral hemorrhage that's really um, likely to be associated with being shaken. And the only person who was around was the nanny. That, and they said, well, she did the shaking of that, thus, you know, responsible for the manslaughter um, of, of the child. Um, but the, the argument, and it was not a successful argument, but it raised this issue of causation. The argument that the defense attorney put forth was they called into question causation. They said, look, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, Louise Woodward, that was her name, that um, she did not shake the baby. She was just patting the baby, jump, like just like rocking the baby, trying to get the baby to sleep. And what they argued was that the baby had already had a, cere a cerebral hemorrhage that had like kind of closed over, maybe from a fall. And it was the rocking that actually reopened that cerebral hemorrhage that led to the death. That it wasn't her actual shaking of anything that caused that death. The shaking didn't take place. So actually they're kind of calling the question actus reus and causation. Um, it was not a, a successful defense. Okay, the final thing that we're going to talk about and the final element is harm. Now, keep in mind, it's not the intended nature of the harm, but it's the actual harm that determines the crime, okay? And so, for example, in the previous um, example about Chris and the robbery, Chris didn't intend to kill, uh, or Chris intended to rob Sandy. Chris didn't intend to kill Sandy. And so when Chris robbed Sandy and Sandy ran into the road and got killed, Chris is like, well, wait a second. My intent was to rob the harm of robbing somebody. My intent wasn't to kill Sandy. Doesn't matter. Your actus reus, the robbing, resulted in the harm of the death of Sandy. Um, so it's the actual harm that determines the charges, not the intent. Um, in this case, Chris would have been charged with manslaughter, okay, not robbery, because um, Sandy, his actions were the cause of Sandy's death. Um, so let's say, you know, like another scenario, let's say Chris really doesn't like Sandy. So Chris intends to murder Sandy, right? And with poison and, you know, mixes up a whole bunch of poison and some sort of cocktail hands it to him. And then Sandy drinks down the poison. But I guess Chris is really bad at blending up poison. And Sandy didn't die. Just had, you know, passed out, you know, like, maybe, you know, just got really sick. Uh, but they didn't die. Well, you cannot, um, you know, Chris would not be uh, 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 charged with murder because nobody died. That wasn't the level of harm. But they would be charged with attempted murder, not murder, because the charge has to be related to the harm that the accused um, perpetrated. Okay, so just for good measure, let's just go over the elements of the crime Remembering the fifth one that was on the earlier slide, okay, and making sure that you read that as well. So um, the elements of the crime are actus reus, that the accused engaged in the criminal act, that they, that they engaged in the guilty act, that the accused had the intent to commit the crime, that they possessed mens rea, the guilty mind, that they knowingly and intentionally committed the crime. The defendant's actions were the proximate cause of the resulting injury, the action is the immediate or in close relationship with the injury. An actual harm was caused, and that's what dictates the crime that that individual is charged with. All right, that's it for this week. Now, next week, we are going to be looking at the second half of Chapter 4. And so we're going to put on our defense attorney's hat, and we're going to take a look at criminal defenses. In other ways, how do you raise doubt about the case that the prosecutor is making? So we'll look at excuse defenses and justification defenses. In the textbook, you'll be reading about procedural criminal justice. And so we won't cover that in lecture, but it will be in the textbook and you're responsible for reading it. And there will be an extra credit assignment next week um, where you will be um, using a case study to apply what you've learned um, from um, these this week and next week um, uh, to making acting like a prosecutor or um, acting like the defense attorney. It'll be good prep for the upcoming midterm exam. All right. Thanks a lot for listening. Appreciate it. Talk to you again soon.